Father, this morning we praise you because you hold the universe in your hand. You hold each one of us in your hand. And Lord, that is so reassuring in this world that often seems like it's crazy, like it's out of control. Father, we know that you still hold us in your hands, even though we are living in a world that uh, or our brothers and sisters are gunned down in prayer meetings where they're beheaded on beaches, uh, where oftentimes uh, the world seems like a scary place. We don't have to be afraid because Jesus is holding on to us, and you have promised to never let us go. So Lord, this morning we simply ask, as we open our hearts and our minds to you, that you would teach us, that you would speak hope into our lives, and we would be changed because we have encountered the living God. It's in Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Philippians uh, chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 19 and following and a little bit of chapter 4. Uh, continuing our series called A Letter to Friends. And if you don't have a Bible with you, that is okay. Grab one of these out of the pew, look just like this. Turn to page 1,249. And if you need a Bible, uh, just take this. This is a gift that we want to offer to you. If you're going to read the Word of God, we know it'll change your life, and we'd love for you to have uh, a Bible of your own. Hey, happy Father's Day. Now, whoever that applies to, I'm glad that uh, you got it. How many dads are in the room, by the way? Yeah, lots of dads. Okay, how many of you uh, have a dad or had a dad? <laughs> yeah, see, I just want to see who's actually paying attention and, and listening. Uh, I thank God that I had an honorable father who blessed me and taught me important life lesson, lessons. And, and I say that knowing that most of you never met my dad. He passed away in 1997. But he was seriously funny. Now, I think most people, if you really look at dads, all dads are kind of funny. Most of the time, not on purpose, right? You know, we just kind of do weird stuff, and, and our kids laugh at us and everything. My dad was the same way. My dad never meant to be funny. Uh, he was serious. He was stern. He was intense. But he was hilarious unintentionally. I mean, it just was, it was awesome. I mean, he, he, he was suit and tie traditional. And, and a lot of times, I think he, he would tell me to dress better for church. But, uh, but he was suit and tie traditional. Uh, he was a guy that, uh, you know, got into the army and uh, got a crew cut and thought that was the perfect haircut, so he kept it the rest of his life. Uh, and, uh, and he was committed to Christ. He taught me to love and serve Jesus, and that was awesome. Uh, he, he taught me to work hard, uh, even when I didn't want to. He taught me to think for myself and to challenge authority, <laughs> and he hated it when I challenged his. <laughs> yeah, see, that, that, that cracks me up. And, and uh, my dad was a workaholic, he, he, and he wanted to do stuff, but he didn't want to ask for help because he was cheap. You know what I'm saying? Uh, he didn't want to hire somebody who was a professional who could come in and do it in 30 minutes and be done because if he could do it himself and save the money, then he was going to do it, even if it took him all day long to do it. It was just cheap, except for when he went to a hardware store. All right? Some of you are like this. You know what I'm talking about. We're in the middle of a project because he'd take all-day projects. I'd get up in the morning and say, okay, today we're going to do this. I was like, oh, no. So there we are, and, and, you know, and, and I'm just trying to help him, trying to wish the day was over so I could you know, go play. And, and, and he's, uh, he's doing this project. He goes, okay, i got to go down to Sears and get me a new wrench. And I thought, great, because he thinks, he, he says, I'll be back in half an hour. There's no way he's coming back from Sears in a half an hour. Now, if he says I'm going to Sears to get one thing, he's going to be there for three hours, and he's going to come back with a truckload of stuff. He might go in there for a wrench. He's coming back with a toolbox on wheels, you know. It was on sale. I had, it was a good deal. And uh, I think my mom always agreed. But he'd go down there. He was seduced by Sears Craftsman, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, oh, Got to have this, you know. And, and so it just cracked me up. And, and my dad planned everything in ridiculous detail. I mean, he was one of those guys that, you know, before all the navigation stuff, he'd lay out all the maps and plan the trip. And we're going to stop here. We're going to be right here. This is going to be the, down to the minute. And he'd say to us, all right, boys, I want you to be ready at 7 o'clock in the morning. We're going to leave in the car. You've got to be in the car at 7 o'clock. Don't you be late. You're going to be in trouble. We'd be in the car. Two hours later, he'd get there. I mean, we had to take bathroom breaks before he even left the house, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just, you know, my dad was a wonderful and imperfect man. He was a servant of God, much like the people mentioned in our passage today. Uh, 
Philippians chapter 2, beginning of verse 19. Paul is writing to the church that is full of his friends. And, and he's writing about some of his friends. Some of them that, that they know by reputation. Some that are, are part of their church. So listen to what he says as we read uh, this passage. Beginning in verse 19, he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. You know they don't have email or phones, so they got to like send people back and forth to, to find out stuff. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, but not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. Paul is in prison writing this letter and he's saying, I want to come and, and visit you myself. He goes on, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him and, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Flip over a page to chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Paul goes on to write, I entreat Euodia and Sintishi to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. I want you to know that everyone leaves a legacy. Everyone leaves a legacy. If you live in this world, if you have any relationships in this world, then you are making a difference in this world. Okay, anybody alive here today? Yeah, that means that you are in this world. You've already said that you have relationships because you all raised your hand a few moments ago about relationships. That means that you are making a difference in this world. And some of you, even as I say that, are thinking, nah, not me. I'm not important. I'm not significant. I'm not making a difference. Yes, you are. But just to get it home, I want you to look at the person next to you, and I want you to say to them, you are leaving a legacy. Okay, every service we've done that, and there's people who laugh. I don't know why you're giggling at that. Some of you are like, you're leaving a legacy? I don't think so. No. Yet you are. You're leaving a legacy. You see it in the biblical witness that we just read. The, the story that we just read contained both rewards where Paul's talking about people in a positive sense and rebukes where he's saying, hey, you guys are leaving the wrong kind of legacy. He mentions Timothy. He says there's no one like him, that he's genuinely concerned for you, not like those other fakers, that you're, he, he's proven his worth. He's like a son to me. He talked about Epaphroditus, uh, who was a fellow worker, fellow soldier, who nearly died serving Christ. The Philippian church had sent Epaphroditus to Paul to take care of him and to bring an offering to him. And while he was there, he got sick, and, and the people in Philippi heard about it. They started worrying about young Epaphroditus. Kind of like we have a mission team right now in uh, Albania, and there's a, a lot of young adults there and some teens. And, and if one of them got, got, got sick, we would be worried. We'd be concerned about them. That's what happened with Epaphroditus. But Paul lauds him. He says, honor men like these. And, and then you've got Iodia and Sintishi. <laughs> and what does Paul say to them? Hey, hey, ladies, get along, Right? Agree in the Lord. Whatever you're fighting about, resolve your differences. You, you know, your fellow workers, you've served side by side with me. Your names are in the book of life with mine. Get along. Four faith family members who left a scriptural legacy for us to see. And one day, if we are followers of Jesus Christ, if we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, we believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins and was raised from the dead, and we've made a commitment to follow Jesus with our life, then one day we're going to see them in heaven. 
And we're going to be going through heaven, and you're going to go, oh, you're Timothy? Hey, cool, man. Paul spoke so highly of you. High fives, man. I mean, there's no one else like you. That's high praise. You're going to meet Epaphroditus and go, cool, man. I'm glad you hung in there when you were sick serving the Lord. Way to go. Way to be willing to die for Jesus. Right? And then we're going to run into Yodia and Sintishi. Because <laughs> I think they're going to be together. All right? I think, in fact, because this is Chad's twisted kind of way of thinking. I think, you know, because if they didn't resolve this problem that Paul wrote about, I think they're going to have to be roommates in heaven for like the first million years. Okay? It's not biblical, but it's chattical. Okay? And, and so... It's just how my mind thinks. And so we're going to see them. And you know what? I'm going to say, I don't know what you guys are going to say. I'm going to ask this question. What were you fighting about? What were you fighting about? Because you got called out in the Bible. There's not a lot of people that get called out in the Bible. But you got called out in the Bible. And what in the world were you fighting about? They're going to be so embarrassed and be like, oh, it's so stupid. You know, it's not important. And, and, but we, we all leave a legacy, good or bad, positive and negative, so understand our impact. Understand your impact on the people around you. What kind of legacy are you leaving? What kind of legacy do you want to leave? Because all of our actions have an impact. There's that ripple effect, like you're throwing a, pe a pebble into a pond, and it just gets bigger and bigger. And I'm just telling you, you really have more influence than you realize. That's why faithfulness in marriage is so crucial because it sets a precedent for those who come behind. That's why generosity is such a powerful example because it sets a standard for those who are following you. We all have an impact. Everything we do, in little ways, we have impact. Uh, I, you know, I've talked about my driving from time to time. Yes, I like to go fast. Both my daughters tend to drive more like me than their mom. Okay, and, and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, it just is. But I remember one time uh, when my youngest daughter uh, was like six or seven years old, and she's in the back seat, and we're at a stoplight, and the light turns green, you know, and the, and the car in front of me doesn't move very quickly. And suddenly I hear my daughter go, It's the pedal on the right, you idiot! <laughs> Telling you, we all have impact, right? And at that moment, I was torn between wanting to fall to my knees and repent or turn around and high-five my daughter. <laughs> because, like, I'm so proud of you, dear. Because I taught her that, okay? <laughs> we impact in little ways, but we impact in significant ways, too. Uh, I was in high school, and my dad, who had a really good job at, at ASU, lost his job because he refused to be unethical. I, I don't know the details, but it involved like taking kickbacks from vendors or whatever, and he said no, and he lost his job. And I learned that personal integrity is worth more than money. It's worth more than job security or comfort. Um, you're leaving a legacy. Your life has an impact on many people. And, and, and let me just say this. If... If you look at your life and you don't like the legacy that you've been leaving, God, our God is a God of redemption and he's a God of life change and, and it can be a different one from this day forward. You're not stuck with what the past has been so far. You can start writing a new chapter and creating a new legacy and, and sometimes you have to go back and apologize and, and tell people you're sorry and, and, and start over again, but God allows you to do that. So if you look at your life and you don't like the legacy you're leaving, you can change that. But you are leaving a legacy. All of us are leaving a legacy. So let me ask you this question. If you were in the Philippian church, what would the Apostle Paul have said about your life? Which list would you make? The reward list with Timothy and Epaphroditus? Or the rebuke list with Yodia and Sintishi? Because we all leave a legacy. And from this passage we learn to celebrate and honor servants. Celebrate and honor servants. Look at verse 29. The apostle writes, So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. You know, a lot of churches tend not to do this or they do it really poorly. Like, like for instance, some churches uh, kind of do it wrong because they celebrate and honor servants, or not really servants, but people who give a lot of money. Right? 
You ever been in those churches? I mean, I grew up Baptist churches, very plain, very ordinary. And I remember the first time I walked into a cathedral and, and I was just in awe. I was like, man, this is beautiful. This is awesome. And they had these stained glass windows. I'm like, those are phenomenal. But there was something ugly down at the bottom. And I walked over to see why there was something ugly stuck on the bottom. And you know what it was? It was somebody's name stuck on there because they donated money. And I thought, you adulterated this work of art that's honoring God because you want some credit? How tragic. How sad. And yet people do that. And, and, and churches a lot of times and organizations will, you know, make a nice, you know, metal, beautiful tree. And they'll give you, like, if you give a little bit of money, they'll put your name on a, on a leaf and stick it on there. And if you give a lot of money, they'll give you a bigger leaf. And if you give a whole lot of money, I guess they'll name the tree after you. I don't know. I've had people come to me and say, Pastor, we could raise money for the new church if, if we just had people buy a pew or a seat. And I go, uh-uh, that ain't happening. That's not happening. Because you know why? Because one of my like, pet peeves that I hope I never catch anyone ever doing is walking into the church and looking at someone and saying, hey, you're in my seat. <laughs> yeah. Hey, if you don't get here early enough to get your seat, sit someplace else. Because <laughs> if I catch you, you know, asking someone to move because it's your seat, I will show you your new seat. It'll be that bench out front, okay? <laughs> this is yours right here for you because we don't do that here. That's not our value. And so the last thing I want is you to walk in and go, it's my seat, it's got my name on it. It's not happening. Jesus said, look, when you're giving, give in secret. Don't, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Don't, don't, don't do it so people will see you and applaud. And so I think some churches, you know, kind of celebrate and honor people poorly because they do it wrong. And then some churches just don't do it at all. They're, they're like, oh, no, we're not going to honor anybody because if we honor somebody, then, then the people we don't honor will get offended. And I grew up in a lot of those churches. We're not going to honor anybody because if we, if, we, if we name these people and we celebrate their service to Christ and we don't name these people, they'll get mad. And, and truthfully, if you get upset because you're not honored, you really need to repent because that's pride. And, and maybe all the stuff that you're doing that you think is worthy of honor isn't all that honorable. And, and by the way, in case uh, uh, you're one of those that's easily offended, let me go ahead and apologize now preemptively because it's only a matter of time before I will offend you. I don't do it on purpose. It's just kind of my nature. I'm just going to offend you and I, I don't want to. If I, and if it is on purpose, you'll know it because it'll be like, you know, face to face kind of thing. But, but that's just it. We, you know, some of them just don't, we're not going to offend anybody, so we're not going to honor anybody. And that's crazy. And then some of them don't want to offend, or they don't honor anyone because they feel like they might feed their pride. I don't know, if you grew up in church, you've heard this phrase, well, we'll keep them humble. We'll keep them humble. Well, we can't honor them because then we might be feeding their pride. So we'll keep them humble. You know where in Scripture does it say it's my job to keep you humble? You know that? Nowhere does it tell me that I'm responsible for your humility. Each one of us is responsible to be humble servants of Christ. Okay, and we're to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand that he may exalt us. We're not to humble each other. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Not mine, not yours. And, and so why would we avoid honoring worthy servants because we're afraid that we might feed their pride? And, and I'll, By the way, if you hang out with somebody very long, you know whether they're serving because they want recognition or whether they're serving because they love Jesus. It doesn't really take that long to figure it out. Just don't mention them once and watch them get mad, and you're like, okay, check them off. Got it. So I tend to be really biblical. And, and when I read this passage, I went, wow, Paul encouraged us to celebrate and honor faithful servants. I think I'm going to do that. <laughs> and people tell me, don't do it. You'll offend some people. I went, okay, well, I want to tell you about some faithful servants that bless me, bless your ministry leaders, really have blessed you by what they've done. I, I can't name everybody because we had over 500 people serving Christ last year through the ministries of Calvary. But I just want to tell you about a few people who have blessed me and I think are worthy of honor. There's this guy named Kurt that's part of Calvary. He's been part of the church over 20 years. He's served as a Bible teacher, a deacon, executive counsel. He's helped rewrite the Constitution. And he's 90 years old and he's still serving as our volunteer chaplain at the hospital. Is that cool or what? That means if you're old and sick and in the hospital, he's going to come see you. He'll make you feel better because you're like, I, I'm not as old as him. I should do better than this. <laughs> There's this little lady named Geneva. 
that uh, blesses me every time I see her. She, she's behind the scenes. She never will be up front in, in front of anyone. Uh, just a quiet servant. What Geneva does is she hugs people and she prays for people. And when she tells you she's praying for you, she really is. And, and she gets here early on every, every Sunday that she can. Her, her husband doesn't come to church, but he lets her go to church. And so she comes early on Sundays and she cleans the kitchens and she makes coffee for people. That's a servant worthy of honor. Uh, there's this guy named Roland who, is, who was successful in business. He, he uh, started helping with our financial team as a consultant. And then he started serving on stewardship and then uh, executive council. And he, now he's our treasurer. And he's quietly helped us be in a strong and healthy financial position as a church, even through the recession. He's part of the reason we've been able to build on the property. And he's a servant who's worthy of honor. Uh, there's so many more, but like I said, uh, I want to talk about some teams, not just individuals. Like, we got this team that we call the parking lot team. Bunch of guys. Yeah. I don't know who dresses them, but it's kind of, you know. I think they call each other up on Sunday morning and say, hey, what are you going to wear? Uh, but, uh, but these are guys that, uh, they're out there, whether it's cold or whether it's hot or whether the asphalt's melting, trying to help you find a parking space as close as possible to the church. And if you can't find one close, they're driving that little golf cart to go pick you up and bring you here as quickly as possible to get you out of the heat and into the air conditioning. And no, I just want to go ahead and address the myth right now that they're not out in the parking lot because they're too mean and nasty to be inside with people, okay? <laughs> I don't know who started that myth, but it's not true about all of them, okay? Uh, the, uh, and then we've got the, the office helpers is what I call them. I, I don't know what else to call these wonderful people that come in week after week and do little things like fold the bulletins that every one of you got today. Uh, and and uh, they, they fix the stuff in the pews so that there's pencils and pens and envelopes and, and guest cards and, and they help count money and answer phones. They're such a blessing to us as a staff week in and week out. And then we got my favorite team, which is the tech team. Now, the picture up there that you're going to have, that's the worship arts team, the whole team. Everybody that you don't recognize, those are the tech people. Those are the people who run the lights and the sound and the computers. The ones who handle the tech are my favorite people. Not, I don't have to say that because they'll turn my mic off if I don't, okay? <laughs> but they could. Um, now, I say that because they're the people who are serving in a job that nobody notices... Hey, they, they're, they're talking to each other now, aren't they? <laughs> They've got some kind of preschool plot going on where the babies are like, hey, you scream on the left, I'll scream on the right. We got this. You got to love kids. You know what that is? That's the sound of life right there. Isn't it beautiful? Just drink it in. I know at 2 a.m. it's really frustrating. <laughs> but uh, that's why we pray for the parents. Uh, no, the tech team, nobody notices them unless they make a mistake. How would you like a job where nobody ever noticed what you were doing unless uh, you made a mistake? And half the time, the mistakes aren't even there. It's just some interference comes in and makes it pop or do something weird. And, and I appreciate them. And I think the computer person has the hardest job in the church of anyone. Think about this. They have to listen to my sermon like four or five times a week. And they've got to pay attention. They can't dot off like some of you guys are. I mean, you can check your phone, you can, you know, take a nap, whatever. They got to pay attention because they got to push the button for the next point. Uh, and then there's our children's ministry team. What a glorious team this is. I mean, we've got over 200 volu or volunteers. We've got over 200 children every week on average. And we've got to have this army of volunteers that is leading these boys and girls to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And they come in during the week to get stuff ready. And they're here on the weekends to, to love your kids and to take care of your kids. And they are just beautiful servants of Christ. I thank God for these and many faithful servants that I didn't mention today. You see, Paul challenges us to honor servants like these. And did you notice Paul offered a rebuke for the disobedient servants like Yodia and Sintishi? He, he called them out, and I told you, we're biblical around here. So, today, we're not going to do that, <laughs> okay? I wouldn't do that to you guys from the pulpit. No, I'd want to be face-to-face -face if I was going to have that conversation. <laughs> but some of you got a little bit nervous when I said that, didn't you? Some of you were like, you squeezed your, your spouse's hand a little bit tighter, like, oh, no. Is the pastor going to name my name? Hey, I wouldn't do that, but if the Holy Spirit made you nervous, maybe he's calling you out, and maybe you need to listen to him. 
So we want to celebrate and honor faithful servants. So let me close with this question. Who do you want to honor? Who do you want to honor? Who, if we're to honor servants like these, who is it that comes to your mind? Now, today's Father's Day, and it's a day that's set aside to force us to recognize fathers, whether they deserve it or not. Think about that. I mean, honestly, some of us have honorable dads, and some of us don't. Uh, but as you look at your life, at the life of the church, at the people around you, who do you see or who do you know that you want to say thank you to? Who has left a legacy of, of hope and blessing that has impacted your life? Who do you desire to bless because they've served God and served you and made a difference in your life? By now, I hope every person has a name or a picture of someone uh, in their mind. Your assignment this week is to honor them. What are you going to do to honor them this week? How are you going to bless them? Uh, and please, please, please don't wait until their funeral to say nice things about them. It happens so often. I, you know, I do lots of funerals and memorial services, and people get up and say wonderful things about the, their loved ones and their friends. And, and then I always wonder, did you tell them that when they were alive? Most of the time the answer is no. Don't wait until it's too late. Whoever has blessed you, whoever has encouraged you, then, then this week figure out a way to tell them thank you. Face to face, sit down with them and, and just say, hey, I want you to know that, that God's really used you to make a difference in me. And tell them how. And some of you are like, I couldn't say that. It would be too awkward. It would be too embarrassing. Then fine, write it down. Write it on a piece of paper. And give it to them. Some of them might frame it because your words will be refreshing blessing to their soul. You know, just look around you for a moment and there are some people who, whose lives are desperate for some encouragement. They're desperate for some hope and to know that their life is making a difference. You can speak hope and blessing into their life. You can water their soul and, and give them strength to carry on. Some of you are desperate for that yourself. Look outward and, and bless. Think about this. Last week, Pastor O.C. talked about do everything without grumbling or complaining. If we stop complaining, that's great. But what if we start blessing? What if we start encouraging? What if we start telling people, hey, I saw you doing that. Good job. Way to go. That made a difference in me. That, that encouraged me. What if we became that place that not only didn't complain, but started lifting people up and, and, and just being that place of encouragement? I guarantee you, if we do that, people will be knocking down the doors to get in here because we all need that in our lives. Don't wait for somebody to surprise you from a, a pulpit or a stage or tell you how they're blessed or how you bless them. Why don't you start the ball rolling and bless those around you? So my prayer for you today is that you will live a life deserving of honor and that you will honor those who have served well. After all, everyone leaves a legacy. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for changing our lives by sending Jesus into this world to be our Savior, to pay for our sins with his sacrifice, God, we don't deserve to be called sons and daughters, but you have called us that. You have blessed us. And Lord, we, we hear your command today that, that first of all, we want to honor Jesus with our whole lives, but you've told us to honor uh, worthy servants. And God, teach us how to live life that is worthy of the gospel, but also give us that, that power to bless those people around us, that we might lift up our friends, our neighbors, our family members, and honor them. In Jesus' name, we pray all of this in the name of the one who lifts us up, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God together.